I will let you know that my name is Amy D'Amico and I am the Division Director of Professional Services at the Smithsonian Science Education Center. I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of the Smithsonian to the Stories of Women of Color in STEM webinar, the second in our series of webinars to complement the release of our ebook with the same title. So I'm going to get us started with just a little bit of uh, webinar logistics. Next slide, please. So just so that you are aware, um, this session is going to be is currently being recorded. Um, your as I noted earlier, your camera is off as well as your microphone. There will be a Q and A session at the end. Um, so just so that you know, um, you know this will be recorded and and posted and publicly available. Um, so you know, sort of take care to um, you know be be mindful of that. Um, in terms of the webinar features. If you have questions during the, the webinar, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box if you're able. It's going, I realize it, it's a little dependent upon what sort of device you are uh, logging in with us on today. Um, that makes that easy, easy or difficult. Um, you can also take advantage of the chat box. Um, we encourage you to rename yourself with your organization and location so that you know folks are aware of where everybody is coming from. Um, if you are, for those of you who are Johnson & Johnson employees that are joining us today, um, and you are a member of an ERG, please go ahead and put that in the chat box so that we have that data point um, uh, for this webinar. You also have the option to activate subtitles at the bottom. Um, if you're having challenges with your audio, um, you can go ahead and, um, and do that and that will that should help. So the Smithsonian Science Education Center uh, was founded in 1985 as a collaboration between the National Academies and the Smithsonian to improve science education for students across the globe. Our mission is to transform K-12 education through science in collaboration with communities across the globe. In order to make that happen, we strive to ensure that we are inclusive of all students, particularly those who are historically underrepresented in science and STEM, which is what brings us together today. We understand that we can't tackle this challenge alone, and we're pleased to collaborate with organizations representing both education as well as business and industry, like our partner here with us today from Johnson & Johnson. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Dion Wright to invite him to say a few words about the collaboration that Smithsonian and Johnson & Johnson are currently engaged in. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, my name is Dion Wright. I am the program manager for our Women in STEM 2D Youth Pillar. And also, I'd like to say a thank you to the Smithsonian Science Education Center for your continued partnership with Johnson & Johnson and our We STEM 2D initiative. And one last thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for attending, all the parents, teachers, students, anyone who's viewing uh, for joining us today. One of the best aspects of the virtual platform is that you can join from anywhere, coast to coast in the United States, around the globe. And that's one of our aims in the We STEM 2D program. As a part of Johnson & Johnson's Health for Humanity goals for 2025, we aim to spark enchantment in girls' and young women's interests in STEM 2D subjects which are science, technology, engineering, math, manufacturing, and design. And this means reaching you wherever you are. If it's in urban centers, small towns, villages, rural communities, and just like Amy said, reaching those historically underrepresented communities to provide you with more resources. And we aim to ensure that STEM2D is accessible, available, engaging, interesting, and most importantly, fun in any place or setting around the world. No matter your religion, race, background, ability, age, you have the potential to change the world in a positive way, just like the inspiring women we have speaking and answering your questions today. And for all of you boys and young men who are watching, you're a part of this journey too. As you can see, I'm not a woman and my background isn't in STEM, but here I am at Johnson & Johnson, one of the world's greatest pharmaceutical companies. What is important to remember is that we all have a mom, sister, aunt, friend, your teacher possibly, who is a girl or woman. And our allyship, support and empowerment is crucial. Being inviting, accepting, and not deterring your girl or woman counterparts is how we achieve a more equitable future. And we can only truly succeed if we all succeed. 
So remember to empower all those women in your life and let them know their current impact and their potential impact on the future of our globe. So as you all listen to our Women of Color in STEM from Johnson & Johnson, I hope that all of you are inspired to pursue STEM 2D subjects. And more importantly, you're inspired to always pursue your dreams and goals and to not be deterred from striving for and achieving the greatness that's, in, that's within you. Our Women of Color in STEM this webinar, as well as others, have laid the foundation for you to know, yes, you can achieve your goals. Yes, you can do anything you put your mind to. And as trailblazing woman scientist Marie Curie once said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is to only be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. So as you listen, internalize these words and the words of our outstanding panelists, and don't just believe, know for a fact that you can achieve anything and have no fear because you are the leaders and innovators for creating healthier people, healthier communities, and a healthier, brighter future. So I'd just like to say one more thank you so much to all of you for attending. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Smithsonian, and please enjoy this webinar. And now I'll pass it on to Kara. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that you could join us today. Uh, welcome to our second Stories of Women of Color in STEM webinar. I'm Kara Hackett. I'm the Marketing and Communication Specialist here with the Smithsonian Science Education Center. So like Amy mentioned at the introduction of this webinar, uh, this webinar serves as a companion to the Stories of Women of Color in STEM ebook, and it is available on, our, uh, on the Smithsonian Science Education Center's webpage, and I will drop a link in the chat to the ebook shortly. But the ebook features the biography features the biographies rather of five trailblazing women who have made history through their scientific discoveries and innovations. So this serves as a web, this webinar serves as a companion to the book. And once the webinar is over, I'm dropping the link to the ebook in our chat now. Hope you all can go ahead and read the stories of the five women featured in the book and may even inspire some of your own uh, career decisions as you grow. And so excited for today's conversation. We have three lovely panelists uh, joining us today. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them. So we have Robin Kumalui, who is the Vice President and Chief Quality Officer, Pharmaceuticals at Johnson & Johnson. Her interest, at science at a young, her interest in science at a young age led her to pursue a degree in biological sciences with a specialization in microbiology from Rutgers University. She has more than 30 years of experience within the pharmaceutical industry, and her expertise ranges from over-the-counter medicine to food and beverage products. Next up, we have Willi Kosol. She's a technical launch integrator at Johnson & Johnson, a native of Thailand and the youngest of nine children. She earned two associate's degrees in biology and chemistry, two bachelor's degrees in public health and biomedical engineering, and a master's degree in biomedical engineering with a tissue engineering focus. Sounds like a lot of study time. In her role in Johnson & Johnson, she's helped to ensure the successful transfer within the product manufacturing products process, which enables the mass production of new products. And lastly, we have, we have Sharina, sorry, Shalina Ramnarine. She's a product development cardiovascular payer marketing at Johnson & Johnson. She holds a PhD in human and statistical genetics from Washington University in St. Louis. And she's also earned undergraduate degrees in, bio, in biology and statistics from the University of Georgia. She is a native of Trinidad and Tobago and holds a strong value for community as a result. All right, so we are now going to kick off our session with our panelists. And we know that all scientific discoveries, all discoveries start off with just like that one spark of curiosity. So Robin, what was the first experience, experiment that you remember performing in elementary school 
And how did this experience cultivate your career within microbiology? Hmm. You know, as I think back, it's interesting because the first experiment actually wasn't, didn't have anything to do with biology, more so it was around energy transfer, which at the time I didn't know what that was. But I'm sure many students have done this, especially younger students, where you have a magnifying glass and you're holding it to the sun and you have a paper or something behind it and it sort of sparks that flame. So for me, that was sort of the very first experiment that I was involved in it. I can remember um, as a young child and that really fascinated me because it was like magic. Something happened mm -hmm. and, you know, from nowhere. And mm -hmm. so for me, that was very exciting. I will say that that gave me, you know, the curiosity and of course, micro, the micro world is the unseen world. And so just like that experiment it was something from nothing but I'll tell you the one the one experiment when I was a little older that really got me interested in microbiology was maybe it was junior high and so we had potable water and there was this question about well there are things in there that we can't see and we sort of looked at it in the microscope and we saw some things there but then the question was what do you think would make the organisms in this water grow so I have to tell you, my experiments sort of flopped. <laughs> so I'll be honest about that. I was really, well, you know, it'll have protein, it'll grow. So I decided to add protein. But the, the one that grew the most was obviously the one that had glucose or sugar in it. So that really took off. My protein experiment sort of only had a little bit of growth. But it was that again, cloud of turbidity from those microorganisms growing, again, from clear nothing to something that really got me fascinated in microbiology and I guess the unseen um, world of science. So that was really, really something that was inspirational for me, just that unknown world. Thank you, Robin. My next question is for Will I. So Robin, you spoke of kind of like this unknown world. And Will, I would like to know if you had a similar experience of kind of moving to an unknown, uh, new unknown country as you moved from Thailand over to America by yourself at such a young age. So can you describe what that process was like for you from moving to Thailand to America by yourself? Then I have a second part of that question. Were there any programs, resources, or people who, know, who helped you navigate the beginning stages of a STEM career in a new country? Thank you for the question. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for the, um, thank you the organizing team and also, um, you know, the, audience who take the time to join the event today. I hope you enjoy and take away something meaningful um, after the event. Just to share a little bit about my background, right? I am the, as you mentioned, um, Kara, the youngest of nine and the first in my family to um, be educated beyond primary school. Um, I grew up in a subsistence, uh, subsistence farming family uh, in the Northeast of Thailand, which is the world of farming. Um, I immigrated to the U.S. on my own, um, knowing no one, and I didn't um, know any English at the time and had very little uh, money to my name. I sort of uh, decided to take a leap of faith and uh, build my life from the ground up. Uh, once I get here, I am fortunate enough to be here today uh, to share my experiences and perspective with you and the audience. Um, thank you for that. I felt like I got myself, you know, thrown into an open ocean without a life vest. And in itself, it sounds tragic, but uh, there's so many learning. There's so much strength that has been built over time to, um, to got me to this point, I should say. Um, there, there were the initial phase of, of, you know, moving here. I didn't know the language. Therefore, that was the first thing I had to do. So I, I, I go to school, learn the English, and you know, it took me about six months to a year to really start having uh, some sort of meaningful conversation. So once I got to that point, I was able to then uh, start exploring what are um, 
you know, some of the education that I could participate in or gain more, right? Because that was um, uh, my goal. I have always had the, you know, this prize um, in my mind that one day I would be able to achieve a, a graduate school, which is, you know, what I really dream of at the time. Um, I, um, I would say there was a, a point in time where I had to, you know, work two, three jobs and still going to school. Uh, somehow I made it work. There was a 24 seven nonstop. Um, but I, I, you know, I kept my dream uh, with me and I, I, I knew that uh, the journey will be long um, and it can be long, but I, I know one day it will become a reality. Um, so to, you know, I, I can say that I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't because of many people who have extended their, um, their helping hand my way. And there were many programs that I participated in that, um, uh, you know, I, I can't mention them all, but I, I would like to mention two people and two um, programs perhaps that uh, I feel um, stood out. So the first person was actually a friend of mine. Um, who I knew uh, early on in the years uh, when I started, um, when, when I first came here. I was at the time um, have a permit where I could work in the US and I was looking for a full-time job. I applied for a job online. It was a sales job at the, uh, a tele telecommunication company. And uh, at the time my English was, you know, not at all at the professional level. And this friend of mine had um, sat me down and he went online and Google um, the top 10 question, top 10 interview questions. Um, I, I was called for a phone interview. And because of him helping me basically practice that interview questions until I get it down, th that I sound <laughs> almost like a professional. <laughs> so I was able to um, then pass the phone interview and I was called for in-person interview. And he said, I can't help you there. You're on your own. <laughs> um, long story short, I was able to uh, ace the interview and later on, you know, became a top 10 seller um, in that 400 people office. Um, and I learned a lot of English in that job as well, because I was forced to speak uh, eight to 10 hours a day, right, in English. Um, so that was one person. I am grateful to, to his service until this day. Another person I felt made a significant uh, impact in my early um, journey, I would say was a professor um, at a community at Middlesex County College. He was, um, he was, um, he assigned, one second, sorry. Mommy. Yes, please. There was something to go on here and then we had to another part of the Sorry, my. Sorry about that. My son is also sick. So we're both home. <laughs> I'm not sick, mommy. Okay, baby. <laughs> so another person was my professor at uh, community college and he assigned us to do this uh, assignment. Basically the, uh, the goal was, or the assignment was for us, for the students to explore the career options. And at the end of the semester, we would have to each uh, present this, these career options that we found interesting and we, you know, that we would want to pursue and we have to explain the reason why. So we basically was forced to learn both the PowerPoint creation and also uh, the speaking, uh, public speaking and also uh, research in one assignment. And there I was exploring, you know, different options do I, want to, do I want to be a doctor? Why do I want to be a doctor? What is the lifestyle of the doctor? What is the career progression of the, a doctor? And that's how I sort of ended up with the focus in now uh, in um, biology. And later on, he had um, sort of challenged me to, you know, he had said, you, you took visual basic class with me and you, you did very well. Have you ever thought about engineering school? And I said, no, of course not. I'm a woman. Why would I think about engineering school? And he had challenged me to take a class in um, biomedical engineering. He said, if you don't like it after one, one class, you can always do whatever you want. 
And I took his challenge on that. And ever since then, I have, um, that was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life is to continue my education in this field and, uh, and being able to, you know, contribute to the work that we do today to save patients' lives with our CAR-T product. Um, two program I want to mention, um, sorry, this is a long um, answer here. Uh, the first program, I would say that um, uh, when I was in, in college the second time for my uh, biomedical engineering degree, I was chosen by the Dean of School of Engineering to receive the Donald Knapp Scholarship. Um, Donald Knapp, just to provide a little bit of background here, Donald Knapp was, um, was uh, the person selected to receive a scholarship from the Johnson's brother uh, who um, founded the Johnson Johnson family company um, because of, you know, his, um, he didn't have any resources to help him. He was out of school for a while and he wanted to return to school, but he didn't have any funds. So the Johnson's brother provided him the scholarship and he uh, since then became uh, a VP within the manufacturing in the early days of Johnson Johnson. And uh, he has then left this scholarship in his name to you know, help people who had similar background or, or journey as him. And I was fortunate enough to um, have been selected for, for that scholarship. And it greatly helped me propel to you know, the lack of resources and overcome that hurdle. The other program uh, was called LCM. Uh, this Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation Program. Uh, this was, uh, again, another scholarship that was provided by the National Science Foundation in the CEF. Um, it has many support um, for students um, like myself and others during academic coaching, experiential learning, graduate school uh, visitation, and so on. So there's so many support um, that was provided for me at the time. So these were you know, the people and the uh, program that I find very made a great impact um, in my career. Look, mommy. Thank you, Willi. <laughs> so, Shalina, my next question is for you. Uh, Willa, she spoke beautifully about her experiences from moving from over to, from Thailand over to America. And I understand that you are from the beautiful twin islands of Trinidad and Tobago. So did your culture have any influence on your STEM interests as a child? If so, how did you cultivate these interests as you progress through school? Absolutely. First of all, I love that you know that it's the beautiful twin islands of Trinidad and Tobago. So shout out to all of uh, my Carib folks on here and folks in the diaspora. Um, you know, I put that I'm a native of Trinidad and Tobago in my bio because it has shaped so much of who I am and so much of how I show up in the world today. You know, my grandmother, when I was growing up, um, my grandma was Indian and my grandma raised me. So I would just be, you know, this little black girl with this Indian woman. She used to iron people's clothes for a living. So I'd have like my little book bag with all my books where I would sit in the corner and read while she was ironing people's clothes. Um, and I just saw so much community, so many different people of so many different faiths that were around me. Um, and I never received any messages about, you know, you're a woman, you should do this, or you can only do this. Like, it was a very a supportive environment for whatever I was interested in. When I was a kid, I was really curious about like, why is my hair different than the rest of my families? Or like, why is my skin color different? You know, why is my shape different? I had all these questions in my mind about me being black and looking black, but then I'm part Indian and like, what does that mean? And how does that translate? And when I moved to America, I was 10, uh, so many people thought I was African-American and I would hear like, oh, you know, you're gonna get diabetes or hypertension. And I wondered like, is that true for me? Like, because I'm not African-American, like, what does that mean? So it really under, like, was the foundation of my curiosity in what does culture mean? What does ancestry mean? How does that impact disease? And that's actually why I wanted to get my PhD in human and statistical genetics 
and has kind of really stuck with me throughout today. You know, my passion and help equity has really come from that and making sure that people that have all of these different backgrounds get the most out of healthcare. So I think uh, not receiving a lot of messages about who you could be as a, as a girl was fundamental for me, but also that natural curiosity and the diversity that I saw was also a big part of what influenced me. Thank you. And I see in the chat that we have a couple of people um, who also said that they are from TNT and then also someone who says that they are from Jamaica. So you have quite a few Caribbean supporters on this call as well. So as we know that this webinar is uh, supporting women of color in STEM, women, of, women in STEM in general as well. But Robin, I want to know what, are your, what is your opinion on how can we encourage girls to stick with STEM? But Kara, I think we have to start early. And I think we have to give the exposure to young girls. They have to see what the possibilities are in terms of STEM. You know, not just the degree or not just the title. What does that mean in real life? So I think it's exposure very young and continuously. But I also think it's the real life application. Right, so I talk, talked about you know, what sparked me with the magnifying glass and the energy, but these are things that happen every day in life that are related to STEM, right? Even cooking an egg, when you boil an egg and it turns firm, that is STEM, it's STEM in real life. And so I think to really let them see what their career could be, so to expose them to people who are working in the field, like those of us on this panel, to show them how things work in real life and how you can operationalize the things that you learn. I think that's real important. And it's not just the scientists that go to the moon. It's everyday women um, like myself and the others who are on this panel who have chosen this as a career. So I think the exposure is really important and they need to see the numbers, right? So well, I was saying her first question was engineering. Oh, why would I do that? So we've got to make sure that, you know, young girls say, why wouldn't I do that? And so it is that exposure. It is the real life operation of how STEM works, both in industry and in their everyday lives. And then it's continuously doing that so that they can see the outcome. You know, the role that I have for j, j Pharmaceutical is the head of the quality organization. And so women can be in those leading roles. And so we have to show them the outcomes, the everyday work, and just with ordinary women, right? Ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And so I think we have to give them that and we have to show them the wonder and the curiosity and continue that the point for me is that continued exposure, not just a one time thing, but you know, across their journey as they grow, continue to show them these things. Really important that exposure and for them being able to see it in real life. Thank you. So, will I? Uh, Robin just mentioned that we have to start young. We have to start children young um, and getting them interested in STEM so that way they can stick with it. As you were navigating your own STEM career, uh, did you find that there were any classes in particular that were most helpful to you as you went through um, all, of your, all of your schooling? That's a great question. Uh, thank you, Kara. So so many classes that I really enjoy. I consider myself a lifelong learner. Um, I just enjoy the process of learning something new, understanding, you know, things in nature. Why does, you know, leaves have certain shapes? And why does this tree is this shape? Why does this grass look this way? Yes, baby. Where is the phone for this? I'll look for it for you. Can I see number one second? Um, so I, there was one class though that I felt of all the classes um, good job, that uh, stood out, right? Um, I think it was um, the research class. The, fa the reason I, I feel that stood out because is the, the master of all. Um, it teaches 
me how to learn, how to start something from nothing, how to ask the right questions, you know, how to ask meaningful questions, right? So um, first I have to, when I did the research class, first I have to come up with um, a meaningful question um, in, in whatever scope that is, right? And then I have to design the experiment to help answer that question. And there are tools and techniques that I had to learn in order to analyze the data and draw a conclusion within the bound of the evidence or the, you know, the design of the study itself. Um, since, um, since then, I feel like it has been a foundation of how I have been able to adapt and, and navigate in my career. Because if, you know, say uh, someone put a question, uh, pose a question to me and say, uh, can you solve this? Or, or, you know, we don't know how to do this. And then I, in, right away, I would think about, okay, where do I start? So it's always the, you know, the current state versus the future state, right? Um, of, of how we want things to be. And there's always a improvement and how do we come up with the roadmap or the plan or the strategy to get from A to B. And I feel that this research um, had really helped me in, in that area. Thank you. Shalina, Will, I just mentioned developing a roadmap to get from point A to point B. So can you kind of walk us through the process that you took when you realized that you wanted to pursue genetics? And then also, what does an average day look like for you in your role? Yeah, my role has nothing to do with genetics. So I'm in marketing for a cardiovascular business. And I have had, this is the fifth role that I've been in and soon I'll be moving to another role. So I have been able to make quite a lot of different trans, uh, transitions. I've been in regulatory affairs. I've been on the commercial side as a scientist. I've been in business development. So I've had a lot of really different opportunities. And I feel like uh, my PhD is really kind of in a lot of ways what prepared me for it. Um, you know, I think when you get a PhD, you learn how to think critically. You learn how to problem solve, right? You learn how to take a question, break it down, work at it review your hypothesis, try it from a different angle. It's really just a labor in endurance and perseverance. Um, and so that experience really, I've been able to leverage in a lot of different areas and just you know, rely on really great people who've mentored me and taught me new skills. Um, so a lot of my day-to-day -day is spent on calls. There are a lot of calls. Uh, I did not realize how much work would be talking to other people because when I was in graduate school, I spoke to no one. I just sat on the computer and code all the time. So that was a very big transition for me. Um, but a lot of uh, my work in marketing is really getting people on the same page about things, You know, figuring out what's the story, what's the main point that we want to focus on, right? Because there's so much happening in the world. There's so much information from all different directions, but not everything is relevant, important, and needs to be focused on. So it's a lot of setting priorities, getting everybody on the same page, and then being really clear about what steps do we need to take to execute it. So that requires a lot of talking and communication, hence all of the calls. Uh, so that's a big day to day for me. Um, and, you know, why did I choose genetics? I mentioned about, you know, my grandma being Indian and me being Indian and black and being curious about how that influences disease susceptibility. And I also was in LSEMP. Um, and through LSEMP, I heard about an undergraduate summer research program in St. Louis. I had no idea where St. Louis was because, uh, you know, my family was all immigrants. We knew kind of Georgia, New York, East Coast kind of area. So I said, OK, I'll go to St. Louis. Like, they'll pay me for the summer. Why not? Um, and, you know, luckily, I met really great mentors there who taught me about what it is to be a PhD, what it is to be a scientist. And then that's how I kind of chose that area. And I must say, you know, growing up in Trinidad, it was a resource limited environment when I was growing up, but where you like your life situation did not impact your education because education in Trinidad is funded by the government. 
So it was really just a function of like how hard you work. Uh, you could get into kind of any school as long as you had kind of the smarts and the courage to do it, right? And so I've been extremely fortunate to have amazing opportunities when I moved to America. I had really great exposure through LSAM, going to Abercams, summer research programs. There's so many ways that people can get involved. And a lot of these programs are for Black and Hispanic students. That's actually how I got to J&J &J, through a program called S. SMDP, Scientist Mentoring Diversity Program, that's for Black and Hispanic PhDs. So all of these programs have been really instrumental in me getting to where I am today and really leveraging that flexibility to then go into new spaces that I never heard about before that I've been curious in. Thank you, Shalina. Robin, what is an important area of a STEM career that is often overlooked? Hmm. Well, you know, I think it is the shaping and the influencing. And I think for a young scientist, this is something that is overlooked, you know, regardless of what area you're in. So what I mean is, okay, you're a scientist, you're analytical, you work with data, but how do you influence? How do you convince? right? So you've got this brilliant idea and there's an area, maybe it's cancer, maybe it's diabetes. You want to do some shaping in that area, but there needs to be this bridge between the technical data and how do you influence to really get outcomes that you want as a scientist. So I would say that some of the focus on influencing and some of the focus on leadership um, in terms of what outcomes you want. What do you want to shape in the world you're working in? And so often, um, you know, some of the people that I mentor, I talk to them about the fluff and the stuff, right? So we're scientists, we've got our data, that's the stuff. You've got to be solid there. But as scientists and as women in particular, we tend to just put our head down and get the work done we don't have that sort of, um, I would say, way of showcasing ourselves. And sometimes we think that's even impolite. So I think we need to get over that in terms of, you know, you need those leadership skills as well. And that it's not impolite to want to shape and to want to use your science to make changes. So I think that is the part, um, I would say, for women in general that we need to work on and that we need to build as well. You know, I'll give you the perfect example. I, um, you know, thinking about journey to where you want to be, believe it or not, I decided I wanted to be a chief quality officer early on in my career. Um, I would say my, well, maybe I won't say it and you'll know how old I am, but early on in my career. So I'm here with many scientists and I'm like, what what can I do to really get to that point? What's the advantage for me to help me shape the policies around quality and compliance that I want? And so at that point, I realized that I needed more education. So I decided, you know, on that journey to go back and get my master's degree in quality assurance and regulatory affairs, because that would give me an advantage and put me in the rooms where I could start to shape. And I got a lot around leadership in that as well. So I would say the influencing skills um, is really important so that you're able to shape the environment you wanna shape and make the changes that you wanna make and your ability to not be shy, to really speak up and to be able to showcase your work. You know, not in a very um, way that you're bragging, but you can't just keep your head down. And in, scientists tend to do that in general and women tend to do it even more. Um, and I will say women of color do that quite often. And so that, that's the thing, right? You're gonna, you want to do what you wanna do in terms of STEM, but you wanna make a difference, right? We're all scientists for a reason, but in order to make that difference, you have to be heard and you have to be able to influence. So I would say those leadership skills um, are very important and they often get overlooked. And it is the difference between your ability 
really just to contribute in a small way versus a big way. Thank you, that was a great answer. All right, and now we are going to actually take a couple of questions from our audience. Let's see here. So our first question is actually for Shalina. Uh, Shalina, how does being a woman of color contribute to how you show up for yourself? Wow, okay, I think a lot about uh, how I show up and kind of what's the impression I want people to have of me. Um, and I also think a lot about how being a woman of color impacts my experiences, right? As a black woman, but in a lot of ways also as an immigrant woman, um, as a scientist, especially as I move into less scientific functions, I realize there's a difference in the way that you think if you kind of came up the scientific track versus if you came up the business tracks. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I think a lot about how I take care of myself, right? So one of the things that I have come to the conclusion is I can't control what anybody thinks about me. So I should stop trying. What I can control is the, the self that I project to the world, right? So um, how kind I am, how thoughtful I am, how I interact with people, the communications that I have with people, those are the things that I can control. And I'm gonna focus on that. And if somebody interprets that as, you know, the typical things that sometimes women of color get, oh, she's bossy or demanding or stepping outside of the box, like those are things, those are comments that many women of color get. And I can't do anything about that. So as long as I know that I'm being respectful, that I am communicative, that I'm responding to people with empathy, uh, that's pretty much all I could do in that area. Um, so I just wanna highlight that because I think that that's something that many women of color experience. I also think a lot about how do I protect my own space and my own mental energy. So I've really been working on like a healing plan for myself because there are many microaggressions that happen every day and healing is an everyday practice. So I work a lot on how do I fill my Shalina cup and that's by friends and family, yoga. I discovered uh, yin yoga, which is great. Uh, meditation, books. There are many different ways that I try to like fill my own cup. Um, and then I also do think about the spaces that I occupy and what does that mean as a black woman in that space, et cetera. And so I try to leave things better than I found them. And I try to communicate to people about how my experiences shape the way that I show up. And again, what they do with that, I can't control, but at least I have uh, given people my intention, articulated myself and expressed myself. And usually I find that it turns out great. So I just say, you know, I think as women of color, we have a lot of pressure on us. We think a lot about, do I wear the natural hair? Do I wear the braids? Like, how does that look? You know, what if I wear this outfit? Can I wear this bright color? Like there's so many ways in which, um, you know, we can't just do the work. We have to think about all of these external things, but the more I become more grounded and secure in myself and fill my own cup and work on my own healing, I realize like, you know, you just got to just be you and hope that the space that you're in accepts you and embraces you. And if not, find another space because you have so much to offer and somebody's going to love it. Thank you. I can attest to the benefits of yoga. I do a hot yoga class every Friday night. So <laughs> I can empathize with that. Well, Lai, my next, the next audience question is for you, actually. Was there one difficult obstacle you faced in your education or entering the professional field? And if so, how did you overcome it? That's a loaded question, I'll say. Uh, that's a loaded question, I would say, because um, there were so many challenges. Um, almost, you know, all the time, right? If you were to look for it. Um, the way, maybe one, one note I will make is, uh, you know, I, I prep my mind to view these challenges as opportunities. And that um, it will then allow me to channel my energy to create something positive out of it. Uh, that's kind of in general. So um, maybe one example I could provide uh, in terms of challenges in STEM career um, was perhaps early on in my career, I was in, um, in, in early development in R&D. And I noticed that um, 
somehow there was a group of people that were formed um, that I found myself uh, not a part of. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened, but I, I ended up running to another woman uh, of color. And, uh, you know, I sort of vented to her as like, oh, I feel that this happened. I'm not sure if this is something just in my mind or is it really happening? And she basically shared that uh, that was uh, an experience that she had too, that uh, all of a sudden, you know, we're working on the IP intellectual property. So we were working on a concept that could be patentable, right? And uh, we found that um, somehow we found ourselves alone. Uh, while there were another group of, you know, people that are working together and, you know, they have tons and tons of sub IPs. And um, so with that experience, we sort of took initiative to found the uh, innovation pillar for the women, um, uh, the WLI, right? Women leadership and inclusion within, uh, within our team, within our, um, at the Con Somerville campus at that time. And, uh, in hope that, you know, we will be able to support more women that perhaps will be in our situation. And in turns, you know, that, uh, that pillar had grown uh, since we found it in November of 2018. Today, we, uh, there were two people, just me and, you know, uh, my coworker at the time. And today we have over um, 18 mem uh, members within, you know, the, uh, this team. And we are, uh, have been able to make an impact to, to provide, uh, we work directly with uh, USPTO to bring resources to you know, um, women, to people of colors or whoever, men and, and others who could benefit from, from these resources. We have organized countless of events to uh, inspire others to become innovator in their own space. You don't have to be in certain positions, certain function to, you know, be innovative. We want that mindset to be in everyone, right? We want to empower them. Um, so that's kind of a way, I guess, one example that um, I have been able to overcome a, a difficult situation. So, you know, just um, uh, like Michael Jackson said, right? I'm going to start with the man in the mirror. So that's how I felt about my experience. I'm going, going to start with me. And if I see something that I feel need a change, I am going to change it within myself first and therefore encourage others to, you know, make this um, positive impact in the world. Thank you. We actually have a question uh, in our chat box from the audience. So I want to, it's very similar uh, to the question I just asked you, Willi, about overcoming obstacles. But I want to also open it up to Shalina and Robin. Uh, so the question is, how do you all work to uh, overcome obstacles throughout your life? Do you want to go first, Robin, or do you want me yeah. to? Sure, go ahead. I'll, I'll follow you. Okay. Uh, I heard this quote one time that said that the days are short, but the years are long. Like opposite. The days are long, but the years are short. And I love that because I think when you are in the midst of a storm, it feels like that's all that was ever there. And that's all that will ever be. Um, at least that's how it felt for me when I was in the thick of it with graduate school. I was like, is this ever going to end? This is so awful. And there were many times that were really challenging for me and really tested my like mental resolve and thinking that I belonged in that space and thinking that I would be successful in that space. And um, it's kind of funny, but I feel like you just got to get through the day. You know, people say like one step at a time, one hour at a time, one day at a time. That's how I tend to approach obstacles. So um, I run to my support systems. I run to the things that fill my cup uh, in those moments that are very challenging. And then I think about, you know, when is this going to end and what does that look like, right? So it gives me something mentally to focus on in the long term. And what are the things that I need to do to see this through? I think it is very easy when there's a storm to think that you have to do a bunch of things to try to get out of it. But stillness in the storm is also very, very important. And understanding from here, what is the next best thing that I have to do? So the ways that I would say I approach obstacles is learning how to fill my cup, doing that self-work, that self-healing, 
thinking about what do I need to do for the future and how do I get there and then relying on other people to just get me through the day because the years are short and storms don't last forever obstacles don't last forever and usually at the end of it it taught you something it gave you a kind of grit and I have found that those are the moments that actually increase my self-confidence in myself you know, after graduate school, I'm like, you can't tell me that I can't be successful at X, Y, or Z because I have been through it. So, you know, they're not the best moments, but they really do shape and define your character and really show you what you're made of. Thank you. Robin? Yeah. So, Selena, I echo some of the same words. And for me, it's about, you're right, getting through it in the moment, but it's all about perspective. So for me, you know, when you have an obstacle, immediately it looks like the end of the world. Oh my gosh, this is so bad. But for me, it's been really putting it in perspective, just stepping back when you can. And this takes a lot of practice, right? Because obviously as scientists, we always want a solution. We always want to fix. And for me, it's looking at the perspective. What does this really mean? And what do I have to do in this moment? And then, you know, once you put it in perspective, also replaying. Have I been here before? Have I had similar situations? And what was the outcome? Because you'll find that, you know, you've had similar situations. It's a different face on it, but it's the same sort of character of situation. And so, you know, you made it through that last time. And you even can think about the things you learned the last time. So for me, it's about perspective. Everything always looks, you know, worse than it is from my perspective. But then looking at it holistically and saying, what really is the problem to be solved? How am I reacting to this? Is my reaction too much? Is it just too tough? Do I need some sleep? So what is the perspective on what I'm dealing with? Um, you know, there was a good book that I read called Everything is Here to Help You. And it talks about the point you made around what are you learning? Because you do always learn, right? I like the saying, I think it was um, Nelson Mandela who said, I never lose. Either I win or I learn. So everything teaches you something. And for me, it is all about putting it in perspective. And again, I'll say it it does take practice because as scientists, we always want to jump in and problem solve, but it's important to understand the situation you're in and what problem you're actually trying to solve, right? So for me, putting it in perspective and you'll see in the grand scheme of things, this is only a short-term situation. So you don't want to react, right? And make a long-term decision based on a short-term situation. So it is all about perspective for me. Thank you. So we have time for just one more question. Um, and this is from the audience actually. Is there anyone who inspired you throughout your journey? Robin, would you like to go first? Okay. So I, I will say I was, very fortunate um, when I was in high school to have a mentor who was a microbiologist and he was an African-American male. And so, you know, it was one of my friend's dads. So that was really, really important for me. You know, I spoke earlier about exposure and seeing is believing. And so he really helped me shape what I wanted to do. Um, I went into college, I wanted to do, I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be pre-med. And then I had one class, it was an immunology class where we did um, pricking of the finger to blood type. And it was at that point that I realized, yes, I'm a scientist, a doctor, probably not. I don't, you know, the intellect is there, but the fortitude for being a doctor wasn't there for me. I, I felt like I would be the one in the emergency room trying to help the patients, crying with the patients, asking somebody to help. So my empathy level is just too high for me to be in that profession, but definitely a scientist. But for me, it was having um, that gentleman who was African-American, who was a microbiologist, 
that really shaped my career and helped me see the possibilities of what that career could be and told me, if you're not gonna be a doctor, you should go with a specialty, right? And so micro was a specialty and it was something actually that I had loved since the first time I looked in a microscope. Thank you. Shalina, or will I? I can't tell you that there's one person that has inspired me. There have been so many people that have inspired me. You know, I think about my undergrad uh, research professor when I was in St. Louis. I thought he was the smartest person I ever met in my life, and I wanted to be just like him. Um, you know, he was a professor. He did his PhD love him, still interact with him. But I've also been inspired by, you know, when I was in graduate school as one of the few black grad students and the janitors would like come in and say hi to me all the time. And they would be like, I'm so proud of you. You know, you're doing such a great job. And I remember one day seeing a man, one of the janitors, he was probably in his late sixties on his hands and knees scrubbing the ground. And I thought to myself, wow, I have so many opportunities that like he probably didn't have in his life, you know? So I'm inspired by awesome, smart scientists, people that I meet, but also the everyday person that I know that, you know, I've had different doors opened for me and how do I use the position that I have to make their lives better in whatever way that I can. Thank you. I, I I would have to say that, um, that just like Selena said, right, there's so many people that inspired me uh, in my path and have shaped my, you know, the way that I live and, and the way I strive today. Um, I could name a few um, for the interest of time. The first person I already mentioned, right, that was the professor in uh, community, community college who taught me visual basic and she really challenged me to do more, to be more and to discover myself. So I still remember him today. Another, another gentleman was um, during uh, my time at Rutgers, I was in, in um, getting in transfer from that community college to Rutgers. And I said, I really want to join the, um, uh, the honors program. Right. And uh, I have some some trouble. I was like, well, my transfer grade. And, you know, anyway, he basically said, um, figure out a way to um, present myself uh, and, and my GPA and, and, such, and my qualifications such a way that I was able to join the honors program. And I never thought of that. He said, you know, if you if you can't go through the front door, there's always the side door the windows or the ceiling, or you can come underground. And that really opened my mind up to the possibility, right? Sometimes we feel, oh, the, the door's there, you need to come in there. If you can't get in there, then you can't. That's not always the case. And, and most of the time, I think I would say that's not the case. And the last person I would say that, um, that uh, inspired me was uh, our um, executive C um, CEO, Alex Gorski. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with him when I was an intern um, it, back in 2014 and coming from my, my humble beginning where, you know, <clears throat> women and values uh, education were deemed not needed for, for someone like me or that I would probably never accomplish anything. Um, and I always thought that people who are successful, who are able to create impact, it's a makeup of some special kind that is not my kind. And until I met him that day, I was able to check his hand and it, it, it occurred to me that he was just an ordinary person, right? He was just hum another human being, uh, just very good at what he was doing. And, uh, you know, that really helped me come to realization of the possibility, again, yet another layer to say that I could be more, I could do more, whatever that I, I wanted to be and, and what impact I want to make, I should strive for it. So I would say those, those three were um, very uh, impactful. Thank you. I'm going to now turn this over to Amy. Hey, thank you. Uh, I get the honor of just uh, basically saying thank you to, uh, to all of you uh, attendees who have come and spent the hour with us. Thank you to our panelists for being inspirational to myself 
to the youth of the next generation, um, to your colleagues, I'm sure, um, you know, for uh, sharing your stories with us. We truly appreciate that. Um, I think we can all agree that we need more um, collaboration and kindness and coming together. So, you know, having, I think the timing of this session was, was perfect. Um, so, you know, thank you for that. Um, and thank you to Johnson & Johnson for providing us the, the means to be able to do this work. Uh, we can't say that enough. Uh, thank you to Kara, who, uh, you know, was our, our amazing MC and was the writer of the ebook. I encourage you all to go check it out, download it, um, share it with your classes, with your colleagues, um, get it out in the world as broadly as humanly possible. Um, also, a shout out to the director of our center, uh, Carol O'Donnell, without whom, without whose leadership, we uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so, with that, uh, I will uh, end this session and um, invite you to come to the next one because we hope that we continue this great work and get the word out there. So, thank you all.